Alright, so this is my master's thesis project that I'm going to be uh, demoing for the very first time at the Maker Fair in San Mateo. I'll be sitting in the middle with a headset on, maybe some other people will be able to try it out, and people will be able to see and hear my thoughts and my emotions, and if I'm sleeping, my dreams. So the construction is these five wooden ribs that are about half inch uh, thick on every single one of them, a 16 foot bow with 8 foot strips coming up and instead of speakers for the sound system I wanted the dome itself to be the sound source. So what I'm using is an array of contact exciters but they don't make sound in the way a speaker does, it doesn't push air, it just vibrates. So it doesn't really make sound until you attach it to a resonating body which in this case is these wooden slats. So you will get warmth of sound, a projection of sound, especially in this dome shape when you're inside the dome with no visible speakers outside of it. So it's a little interesting to hear the way sound behaves. And I also noticed I was getting a little bit uh, too much high end and not enough mid range, so I added a plexiglass sheet just in this top half to add a few more. The larger surface is giving me a little bit of that mid-range that I needed to round out the sound. Since I have five slats, I am using one subwoofer to fill in all the bass, but I have the opportunity to do six channel audio. So I am going to be splitting up with a surround sound, sound card. I'm going to be sending six independent channels out, not your typical uh, surround sound format. The rear screen projection material is a very thin, lightweight, 100% Piva shower curtain liner. And it's the perfect material I found as a rear projection screen because there's no hot spots and you can see it perfectly on both sides. It's even better standing from this end when I have the projector shooting at the back of it because it shines through. Right now I'm playing with the parameters of the visual distortions and enhancements. So you can see it adds a little bit of motion to uh, the images. The program is designed to recognize certain emotional states. So when I'm wearing the headset and it's reading my emotional reactions and my thoughts, just what my brain is doing when I see an image, then it records a little bit of a snapshot of what my emotional reaction is to that image and then it saves it. So when the program notices that my emotional state is similar to what it was when I saw a picture, it recalls the picture and displays the picture. Other parameters, uh, brain waves, emotional states, facial expressions, these are all tied to the effects and how the effects are being manipulated. So ideally when I'm dreaming, if I have a certain emotional state or a combination of parameters that match a certain picture, that picture will be recalled and then the rest of my brain waves and thoughts and emotions will be distorting the images as well. It's pretty trippy. Since I don't have time, or we don't have time for me to fall asleep directly, I want to start with an image of uh, me just enjoying it.
just hoping we didn't forget anything. So it'll be interesting, I've never actually been to the California Maker Fair. I grew up here uh, before I went to New York and did the Maker Fair twice out there. It's, uh, it's definitely going to be unique and different because it's going to be at a really large fairgrounds, which I've never seen. So I don't know what I'm walking into. There's all sorts of different cross-genre parallel fields of work that uh, it's one thing that I really like about the Maker Fair is the collaborative meetings. People are like, oh, I'm doing this, it's awesome. Uh, over here, and then I'll say, hey, well, I'm working on this. And they're like, oh, wouldn't it be perfect if we combine these two things? Yeah, always a lot of fun, really interesting conversations. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have that here. The opening's on this side, and that gives me plenty of room on the back. All right, so I'm going to go switch out cars, get the other one. So this is going to be cool, man. I, it's a, I know I have my own project, but it's really hard for me not to just run around like a kid at Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory going, What's this? What's that? So, the space is smaller than, uh, than I had requested, but um, I have enough space for sure. I mean, you know, of course it's not ideal, but with technology, nothing is ever perfect with no bugs, no hiccups, no changes. That's just not a thing. So, you have to adapt and sometimes you gotta be MacGyver. I gotta find a new MacGyver reference because it's such an outdated show. <laughs> but sometimes you gotta be MacGyver. Those chairs are like placed so inconveniently. It's just a stack of chairs in the middle.
level when you're shining it on the back since it's transparent uh, rear projection kind of thing it's the thinnest lightest weight you can possibly get you see how we can see the seat yeah 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 so when that light is shining through it's not just <laughs> shining onto it it's going through it yeah. so you're almost staring at a flashlight it's not you way brighter One thing's for sure, it's gonna be trippy. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be chill. <laughs> Trim these super short to be neat before I tin the wires, which is makes it neat, but a little difficult to plug in. So right now, uh, just as a test to make sure that all the wiring is correct, uh, it's stereo matrixed in between all five channels. Well, it's six channels. So when it is actually set up the way it's designed, each rib is its own channel. So each strut is its own sound of a layered instrument. So instead of the traditional 5.1 surround sound that you would be used to in a theater or a movie or something like that, I'm not doing front and back. It's really treating it just as raw elements. <laughs> the way that the computer program works is that every chord that's possible in Western music theory, every type of mode, every aspect of Western music theory as it pertains to the psychology of music is programmed directly to the emotions and the thoughts that I'm thinking and feeling. So if I'm happy, we're going to be in a major scale. If I'm sad, we're going to be in a minor scale. If I'm feeling anxious or frustrated, there's going to be a lot of dissonant chords. Things are going to sound a little disjointed. Maybe things will be a little bit out of key. So my mood is constantly changing the way that the program is working and it's generating the music. Alright, so I think that we're ready to wrap it up. And then come back tomorrow morning and hope that this is all still here and it works. Stop telling you to do stuff that comes out of your mind. Do whatever you want, okay. <laughs> oh, I love the tech. Oh, man, I could trip out on this picture for like hours. <laughs> Man, that's cool. 
never feel that the project is done. In fact, right now I always I always perpetually feel that it's half done because there's so many different approaches to creating something like this. And over the last five, six years, I've developed in their entirety fully functioning versions, about six or seven of them. And they're all different approaches to the the question, can you accurately portray emotions as music and visuals in a coherent manner in real time? Let's make a comfy bed. This is a pretty cool, uh, chill zone though, so if I do festivals or like Burning Man or something like that, set it up with a bunch of pillows, have just like a little layer to uh, sit and trip out in. It's, uh, it's just a little frustrating. Inevitably, right before a show is about to start, there's going to be weird technical errors. So I'm having an issue since I just plugged in the surround sound USB card. The outputs are all grayed out. I think it's because I keep going back and forth in the project between stereo and surround that now the tracks are like locked in and my outputs are grayed out. So I have to go in and reroute everything to its proper channel. Uh, it's a little bit of a hassle, but I can do it uh, in time. super cheap uh, eight channel USB sound card. Every time I unplug it, the computer loses sight of it and it immediately tries to start defaulting to things uh, that I don't want them to do. But it just, it does it by itself. Uh, so for some reason I could not get, I'm um, using synths and Logic Pro and I'm, I've mapped a lot of, uh, of the parameters in there to different channels but it keeps defaulting to stereo. Uh, so I had to figure out a way to override what it was trying to do. So I used Soundflower Bed, which is uh, a program that's like a virtual sound card that you can enable as a de default. And it gives you up to 64 channels of routing and rerouting and directions. So I essentially had to make Soundflower my virtual sound card and then point the outputs of that to the card and then the inputs of that to the program logic that I'm using. So I just I had to essentially bypass the operating system's uh, attempt to try to decide for me what I wanted, which is annoying. So I bypassed everything and now I'm getting the proper sounds out of each channel. So it should work. It should work fine. Five and six, and that works. I still need to configure it a little bit, but at least I know that it's working. Well, let's uh, see how big this uh, projector is going to get. Don't fail me now. Oh! Oh! <laughs> this particular projector is the only one that doesn't have buttons on itself requires the remote control. 
<laughs> you could put the title of the slide as, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> with this conductive, well, saline solution, but salt water is very conductive. Uh, you didn't set the on, parameters on the computer. On what computer? That computer. What? Oh, shit. so amped up all day trying to hustle and, and get this, you know, fixed that, uh, I don't know, I was just uh, emotionally turbulent and I was trying to calm him down and I was sending way too many signals all at once to one area of the parameters and uh, I don't know if it was a processing problem, which is very possible, uh, but the, the headset, uh, kind of just disconnected after that. So I've got probably 50 or 60 different parameters that are being sent out from the headset, from reading the emotions, from reading the thought. And as I was just going through that, I think uh, I ran out of RAM maybe. So I'm restarting it and I'm gonna disengage parameters which are really just for effect, like uh, modulations and, and pitch shifting. I'm gonna see if, uh, if I take those down if it'll help. So I'm controlling what note is playing by thought. So if I push with my mind, I can go up a note or down a note. This is one of the iterations. Or I can set it to only feed major minor chords and what regression to take based on the different emotional parameters. But I can override that by just thinking push. Like, for some reason, putting my hands up like Star Wars Force Push helps. There we go. There we go. <laughs> so it's working. There we go. Yeah. It is a little hard to concentrate. So when I'm talking or when I'm thinking of doing other things, my mind's all over the place. So the notes start changing really rapidly. But I have an arpeggiator set on them. So even if uh, I get stuck on one note, I'm still getting like an up-down accompaniment. I also have a set to stay on. Uh, when I'm set to a piano or any kind of percussive instrument, every time it changes, it's just a single hit. But uh, I knew that uh, 
it, it would be absolute chaos. So I figured I'd start with uh, something a little bit more melodic. Later on, uh, I might alter some of the parameters based on only the instruments being used. And it'll be weird to hear some thrash metal guitars where my mind is not only deciding what note to play, but how to play it, and it'll be manipulating the effects, like having a pedal board that is just constantly being stepped on. Every different user is different. Every different person is different. Music psychology is different for them. I might get happy when I hear psytrance and sci-fi music. Other people might find that uncomfortable. Uh, or somebody might get really, really happy when they're hearing heavy metal. Someone else might get scared when they hear that. So every different user has to spend a little bit of time setting up a profile for what types of sounds and music makes them happy. And then I assign those to those parameters. So what makes me happy might play this. What makes somebody else happy might play a completely different set of instruments.
Because like the reason why you need to develop different profiles for each person that uses it to make it more accurate is because our brains work in different ways. So that would, you know, creating that profile. But I didn't create that profile for each one of the people. It's going off of just the general known areas of the brain that are controlling emotions and things like that. So it means that both of your neural synapses are firing in a very similar way when you're thinking about certain things. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of unique. So it's kind of cool. Thank you guys very much. Congratulations on your thesis. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's a beautiful yes. project too. Thank you. Very 
it would lay a certain way. Yeah. Which is typical of him. I always wonder what goes through his head. Yeah. He's extremely happy. The certain pictures that are showing up, I can tell. He seems pretty calm. What number are you? 31. 31. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You guys, you okay? Oh, sorry. Yeah. You see Tyre's head? Look, look up there. Look on the wall. Back of And I was really interested. A lot of the sounds are based on emotional states. So uh, I went back and I was just like looking at. And at first, I was noticing like high levels of frustration. And then uh, after. I guess just maybe sitting for a bit, those started to come down and engagement levels started to rise quite a bit. And I was noticing the chord progressions, let me show you this. So the chord progressions are set to um, pick one note and then it compares uh, what other notes you could pick and then it picks that note. You can choose to go up or down in order to pick the next chord or the chord before. So one chord would light up and then one chord would light up and then I was getting this strobing scale going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, and then it would stick. I hadn't seen it done, I haven't seen that yet. Uh, but it started cycling through all the chords pretty fast, and then it would stick and hold for a second, and then it would cycle through really, really fast, and then it would stick and it would hold for a second. And I was comparing that with the different uh, motion states of engagement versus boredom. My husband's going to, he's reading the reading sonnet, so he'll give you a better description of letting you know. Fun game, huh? Oh, wow. And yeah, we get a heavy sleep out of him sometimes with melatonin mm -hmm. and them. I'd love to see like that that nighttime. I think he, I think it runs a mile a minute. Actually the whole the whole system was made primarily to record what my husband goes through while he dreams. Cool guys? How crazy is it going up there? Is it really fast? Yeah. It was interesting, it was amazing, it was a unique opportunity to be able to work with somebody that had autism. Because I know that that's one of the applications for therapy. Not everybody communicates the same way and it's also hard to read somebody's emotions that has autism. So although it wasn't the most ideal environment, I know that that's one of the therapies that can help in certain situations. So it was unique to see exactly how the mind was working with someone with autism. And I noticed that it was radically different than the majority of all of the people that tried the exhibit out so far. And I was so fascinated with what was about to happen that I stayed glued to all of the parameters and all the emotions and all the thoughts as they were coming in. And they were radically different. I mean, we do a lot of ABA therapy as well, so a lot of you know, discrete trial. It would be interesting to see his engagement levels and other things when he's doing okay. some of that work because you know, absolutely okay. his attending is pretty good at the time. His attending is horrible okay. at other times. The parents had a very favorable, very positive look on the experience for their child and expressed a definite interest in the future applications of this type of technology. So I can't wait and I look forward to developing it and making it available and also making it known that this type of technology is unique in therapeutic applications. Well, so it's finally over, and uh, 
It was amazing, it was exhilarating, it was very uh, educational because I had never had such a massive sample of society to put the headset on. So it was an amazing experience seeing how all these different minds act and react in various different ways. There were people who had complete control of the musical composition. There were people who were in absolute disarray. And I kept on checking back the software to see what exactly was going on, what levels of emotions were coming in, and what ways they were coming in, and how they were reacting with each other, and, and triggering the music as it was working. I'd get stuck in conversations, explaining the technology, or networking, and talking to other people, and then I would hear something, and I would be like, what is this? And I'd have to run and check and look at the system and say, what is going on in this person's mind that is creating this kind of music? So it was really, really fun for me. I had twins uh, go right back to back and some eerily cool similarities. The way the brains were functioning as the composition was unfolding as they were wearing the headset. And one autistic boy had the headset. I've always wanted to show the potential therapy possibilities for communication and emotional recognition and outlets of communication both ways. Uh, so that was really unique. I was happy that that happened and wonderful to talk to the parents about the results that I saw. We were so slammed all the time. There was 10, 15 people, 20 people at a time waiting for their turn to try on the headset. Sometimes up to a half an hour, 40 minutes, people were like standing around waiting. They're like, I've got to do this. So it was really encouraging. The networking was amazing. Lots of people come up to me and they want to work with me, they want to work together, they want to hire me to come do installations from museums to sound studios to nightclubs to festivals. Wonderful to communicate with so many different people across so many different levels that all spotted what I think of as far as the potential value that this type of technology has. It's very inspirational. The, the creative, the neurons are firing and it was a very awesome, fun experience. I love the Maker Fair. I can't wait to come back.